The year is 1966, and St Kilda have just won their first premiership by a single point. They've just moved to their new home in Moorabbin, begin a new era, and things are finally looking up for the Saints. A decade of prosperity listens on the horizon for the competition's least successful side. Surely. Unfortunately for the Saints, this was not to be the case. Instead, with the introduction of a system called country zoning, the next two decades would be a disaster for the club, as they'd combine with Melbourne for 10 wooden spoons, while Hawthorne and Carlton, who had finished outside of finals that year, would go on to win 11 premierships between them. So what was this system? Why did the VFL see the need to implement it? And how did it shape two decades of league football? Before 1986, the draft system that we see today didn't exist. Instead, the league revolved around the zoning system, where clubs were given exclusive access to players depending on their residential address and where they played their football. This kind of system originated with the metro zoning system in suburban Melbourne. Essentially, each club was given an area of Metro Melbourne in which it had exclusive access to players. This was done in part to create fairness between the rich and poorer clubs, and also as a way to spark club tribalism within suburbs. So, what did a typical club zone look like? Well, Collingwood's Metropolitan Zone, for example, were the cities of Camberwell, Kew, Heidelberg, Eltham and Nunawading. While St Kilda's zone was defined as thence westerly along Warren Road and North Road to Thomas Street, to Arthur's Seat Road to South Road, thence westerly along South Road to the Sea Coast. Whatever that means. In 1967, the VFL made the decision to expand this idea across the whole of Victoria, dividing the state's footballers into recruiting zones for the league's 12 clubs. Conceived with the idea of equalisation in mind, Country zoning instead became a system where the rich got richer. In the 19 seasons between 1968 to 1986, in a competition of 12 clubs, the Premiership Cup was shared between just five teams. Before the implementation of country zoning, players outside of Metropolitan Melbourne had free reign to join whichever club wanted and could afford their services. This led to a VFL that looked very similar to leagues like the EPL and La Liga where the wealthy clubs such as Carlton, Collingwood, Essendon and Richmond were monopolising the top country players, and in a sense, buying the smaller clubs like Fitzroy and Footscray out of success. Thus, the country zoning system was devised as a way for the league to move towards equalisation, where every club had a chance at glory. In 1968, the country zone you fell in depended on which club you played for, and was separated as follows. The Bendigo Football League was given to Carlton, and the Western Border Football League to Collingwood. Essendon got the Wimmera League, the Hampton Football League went to Fitzroy, and the Gippsland and Latrobe Valley Leagues were given to Footscray. Unsurprisingly, the Geelong and District Football League went to the Cats, along with the Murray and Mid-Murray Leagues. Then it was Mornington Peninsula and West Gippsland to Hawthorne, Goldburn Valley and Riddle District to Melbourne, and the Ovens and Murray Football League to North Melbourne. Almost there. Sunraysia Football League to Richmond, River Arena Football League to South Melbourne, and finally, the Ballarat Football League to St Kilda. Thank goodness there was only 12 teams. The zones were meant to rotate every three years to maintain a sense of fairness across the competition, with each club given a chance to recruit for the most productive areas. However, clubs such as Carlton and Hawthorne who got lucky with their initial distributions were quick to object to this idea, claiming that they were reluctant to walk away from the investments of time, effort and money spent in their regions. Although the argument was sound, this was of course against the initial reasoning for the country zoning system, as rotating the zones was really the only way in which this could have worked in favour of an equal competition. So while wealthier clubs were no longer able to monopolise the player market statewide, in reality, it had given rise to a new problem, as some clubs were nearly entirely shut out from talent-rich areas of Victoria. During the 19 years of the country zoning system, the premiership tally is as follows. The teams with stronger country zones dominated premierships, especially Carlton and Hawthorne, who ended the period with 6 and 5 respectively. 
Richmond finished with four, and Essendon and North Melbourne with two apiece. We can see the strength of Carlton and Hawthorne zones when we compare them to some of the league's least productive areas. Hawthorne debuted 15 100 game players from their Mornington Peninsula zone, including seven of their team of the century. Carlton had fared similarly, debuting 10 100 game players from its gold mine in the Bendigo region, four of which would make their team of the century. The flip side of this was Collingwood, Melbourne and St Kilda, who would debut just nine 100 game players from their zones between them, and just one team of the century player apiece, those being Billy Pickin, Gary Lyon and Tony Lockett. Maybe more interesting is taking a look at the Wooden Spoon winners throughout these years, where last place was shared between seven teams. You'll notice that there isn't much overlap between these two groups, with the only club to win a premiership and a Wooden Spoon during this era being North Melbourne, whose three Wooden Spoons came in the first five years of the country's owning system's implementation. Also notable is that St Kilda's six wooden spoons came in the final ten years of the country's earning era. A fair fall from grace for a club that had just won its first premiership two years before the system was implemented, a demise well summarised by author Ian Munro. Only seven clubs had played in a grand final, and one of those St Kilda did so in 1971 with a team created before the system came into play. It had since collected a kitchen drawer full of wooden spoons. Conversely, Hawthorne, after gaining the Mornington Peninsula zone, extended their Premiership hoard from just one Premiership Cup in their history to six by the end of 1986, with names such as Lee Matthews, Gary Ayres and Dermot Brereton headlining the list of elite players recruited from the area. Hawthorne being awarded the Peninsula zone was a true kick in the guts for St Kilda and their fans as well, as the Saints move in 1965 from the Junction Oval in St Kilda to what we now know as RSEA Park in Moorabbin was done in order to position the club as the obvious choice for Melbourne's Bayside region. Instead, in a decision the blind side of them, the club was given Ballarat as their country zone, an area that then St Kilda coach Alan Jeans labelled full of little blokes better suited for the mines. Although, he wasn't much of a fan of their metro zone in Sandringham either, describing it as good for breeding Labradors and not footballers. Over the next few decades, zones would shift slightly and the Saints lot improved when they gained access to players from around the Bayside region of Seaford, allowing them to recruit Robert Harvey and Stuart Lowe. But by that stage, the damage to their recruitment plans was already done. By 1986, the league acknowledged that the system was widely considered an unsalvageable failure of providing equality within the league, and scrapped it for new equalisation policies. Although. Hawthorne and Carlton would still share the next three premierships, as its lasting effects were felt. The following decade and a half was one of the most significant and exciting periods in league history. At the end of 1986, the national draft was introduced to combat the inequality within the league. While the West Coast Eagles and Brisbane Bears joined the competition the following year, 87 saw the introduction of the salary cap, and Adelaide and Fremantle joined the league soon after. Remnants of the zoning system can still be seen today, with clubs' academies operating on a similar system, but with less dramatic results. The current academy systems work on the old school zoning premise, but with eligible players across the whole of Australia zoned off to each club. In this case, the system is designed to promote a more even competition by working hand in hand with the draft, as opposed to instead of it. Despite this, it has still led to outcomes that might not be seen as truly equitable, like when 2015's Pick 3 ended up at the 4th place Sydney Swans, and 2021's Pick 1 ended up at the 7th placed Bulldogs. The AFL tries to combat this with pick bidding and the draft value index, but when you throw in free agency and father-son, the league's equalisation measures are becoming more and more convoluted. But perhaps that's an issue for another video. If you've got an aspect of your team you think we should take a look at this year, let us know in the comments and be sure to like, comment and subscribe for more footy content.